Professional boxers are expected to be tough, determined, and have never-say-die attitudes. But Philadelphia fighters have earned a special category all their own. And there's one boxer in particular whose name is always mentioned at the top of the list when discussing Philly fighters. He was Philadelphia, holding down a blue-collar job before going to battle in the gym or at the Spectrum Arena. He was a family man, an underdog who fought in obscurity for over a decade before he finally got his title shot. He was. Benny Briscoe was born February 8, 1943, in Augusta, Georgia, growing up in what he called a little old raggedy, run-down shack. The family was poor and sometimes Benny would have to steal boards from the fences of neighbors in order to have wood for the stove. He would always have his head shaved bald from an early age in order to save on haircuts. His father was a carpenter, bringing in $50 a week. His mother was very religious and passed down her beliefs to Briscoe. In the South, Briscoe said, most of the black people are religious. That was the main thing you had to go on praying that things would get better. Briscoe would find work as a young teen, delivering groceries for $25 a week, 15 of which would go to his mother. He would then get a job caddying at the Augusta National Golf Course and received a payment of $100 when he caddied for President Dwight Eisenhower. But Briscoe would be sent to Philadelphia to live with his aunt after he got into trouble with the law at age 14. His crime? Stealing candy and fruits. That's the South, Briscoe said. As poor as his family was in the South, it seemed like a resort to what he encountered in Philadelphia. I got tired of paying off guys so I could use the bathroom at school, Briscoe said. That's when I went to the gym and learned how to fight. He would become a gang member, and by virtue of his fighting skills, he rose up the ranks to the title of Lord. But when he made it to the Olympic trials of 1960, Briscoe turned his back on the gang life. Briscoe would turn professional in 1962 at the age of 19. He would remain undefeated until being upset by Percy Manning in 1965. Briscoe would quickly gain a reputation as a determined and intimidating brawler who could break his opponent's knuckles with his bald head. In December of 1966, he would score his biggest victory to date by stopping his future trainer, George Benton, in nine rounds. He would drop a decision to longtime veteran Luis Rodriguez before traveling to Argentina to face future champion Carlos Monzon. The fight would end in a draw. Briscoe would claim that he was robbed. He would return home and continue to campaign in his native Philadelphia, stopping the tough Jimmy Lester and Gene Bryant, but lose another decision to Luis Rodriguez. After dropping a decision to Juarez de Lima, Briscoe's trainer, Quinzel McCall, wanted a more vicious Briscoe. McCall changed Briscoe's state of mind, turning him into a search-and-destroy slugger, instructing him to never let up punching once he had his man on the ropes. In the rematch with DeLima, Briscoe showed off his new aggressive style.
Briscoe reached contender status but still had to hold down a 9-to-5 job to make ends meet. He worked for the city of Philadelphia, cleaning out abandoned homes. I had to clean out stuff that had old urine, bowel movements on it, Briscoe said. The government didn't give you any respirators to breathe through. I didn't care. I was just so happy to have a job. Briscoe would later work in the city's rat control division. When asked by his promoter, Russell Peltz, if he used poison to kill the rats, Briscoe just laughed. He used a baseball bat. Briscoe would wake up every morning at 3.30. He would run 10 miles in the dark before clocking into his job and killing rats for 8 hours, earning $32 a day by 1970. He would eventually transfer into the sanitation department, lifting tons of trash each day before heading to the boxing gym at 6 p.m. for a two-hour workout. When he had a fight scheduled, Briscoe would go into monk mode. He would forego sex, beer, and his favorite dish, hogma and chitlins. Briscoe would contract hepatitis from the job before his match with Luis Vinales. He wheezed through and lost a 10-round decision. The loss almost cost him a shot at Carlos Monzon's middleweight title. In a rematch, Briscoe, now fit and ready, would smash Vinales in seven rounds. The following month, he would take on Carlos Monzon for the World Middleweight Championship. After 10 years of struggling in obscurity, Briscoe would finally get a shot. He had Monzon in trouble in the ninth round, and he felt he received a raw deal in the scoring. Briscoe would later become known to reporters for telling Briscoe-isms, telling a writer one story and then telling another reporter a completely different version. One of his Briscoe-isms is the origin of why he would wear the Star of David on his trunks. One story is that he decided to wear the star in honor of a childhood friend who died. Another was that he wore it in tribute to his first manager, Jimmy Iceland, and then later, Arnold Weiss. I did that when the militant black power thing was big, Briscoe said. I could have used a fist, a black power symbol or something like that, but I thought I'd try something different. So I wore the Jewish star. And then there's my red velvet robe. A lot of fighters are picking up on that. In 1974, Briscoe would get another shot at the title, this go around against Rodrigo Valdez. He had lost a decision to Valdez a year earlier, but was confident of his chances. The fight would take place in Monaco, and upon his arrival, Briscoe was introduced to Princess Grace. While meeting Grace Kelly would be an event that he often bragged about, his fight with Valdez would become a middleweight classic. Carlo, we're in the Stato Edu or the soccer stadium here in Monte Carlo, and we understand that we're having some transmission troubles. A hard right hand rocks Briscoe back on his heel. He's heard he's on the rope. Rodrigo Valdez is ripping him. Briscoe trying to weather the storm. Harry Gibbs, the referee, standing close watching. Briscoe, blinking, rocked back on his heels, and he was hurt by a hard right hand thrown by Valdez. But Valdez has not been able to penetrate since the hard right hand. So Briscoe now comes off the rope. Still looks foggy. There's another good right hand. Another one. Another one. All the expensive seats were sold, but I guess that tells you something about this particular part of the world. Now Briscoe started to bang away at the body. Best round of the fight so far for Benny. Briscoe banging away at the body. Valdez in the white trunks. Right hand by Briscoe found its target. Another one. Good hard right hand by Valdez. And another one. And another one. With Briscoe's style, obviously he has to absorb punishment because he just keeps coming, just keeps coming. And the secret is, the minute you see Benny start to back up, you know that he's in some trouble in a short period of time to win the World Middleweight Championship. Oh, he hammered Briscoe inside and then took it to the head. And Briscoe faded back into the ropes. Briscoe backs into the ropes. 
It's been a very easy evening so far for the referee Gibbs. He's had nothing to do but watch. The right hand again rocked Briscoe as Valdez took it inside and worked the combination. Moro. Briscoe just keeps coming. by Briscoe. Best shot of the fight. He went right into that eye that's cut and opened it up again. Another right hand by Briscoe. Another one. Not a great deal of swelling over the left eye of Valdez, but some of the salve may have gotten in it and obscured the vision. Briscoe has hammered him three times with the right hand. That one missed. Briscoe growing stronger. Had a rocky start. Valdez beat him in 12 rounds. A decision in New Caledonia last September. Briscoe coming, coming, coming. Right hand high on the side of the head. Not a whole lot of swelling in the left eye yet. It's getting to puff some. Briscoe has been, oh, a hard left hook by Valdez. And that starts Benny's nose dripping again. Left hand was blocked, the right score. The right scores again by Valdez. Well, they figured it'd be a Night for Bombers when these two got together, and that's exactly what it is. Briscoe's down! And in Briscoe! Drop! The right hand dropped him on the fight in over. It would be the only time Briscoe would ever be stopped. You can't explain the unexplainable, Briscoe said. Promoter Russell Peltz entered Briscoe's locker room to console him after the loss. It was the first time I ever saw Benny display that kind of emotion, Pelt said. He cried in the dressing room after that fight. After the defeat, Briscoe had a strained relationship with trainer Quinzel McCall. McCall told Briscoe's manager, Arnold Weiss, that Briscoe was washed up. He then told Briscoe not to sign with Weiss, which raised the manager's suspicions of the trainer's motives. Briscoe would then take on Emil Griffith and lose a decision. I quit that night, McCall said. Working with a man as long as I work with Benny, you know all about him. Either he has lost his desire or he's finished. Either way, I always promised myself I would never take him beyond that point. McCall stated that he thought Briscoe was finished as early as 1971, warning his manager to, quote, get the kid some money fights because he's not going to be around long. While McCall's relationship with Briscoe was strained, he was more at odds with his manager, Arnold Weiss, a CPA who was the brother-in-law of Briscoe's promoter, Russell Peltz. This guy is into boxing as a social venture, McCall said. When we were in Monte Carlo to fight Valdez, Weiss was conducting tours of Anzio Beach. He had no concept of what the sport involves when he started and hasn't learned anything since. As for Benny, I'll help him to anything he wants, except fight. When a guy is standing there in the ring, taking punches, seeing his openings and is unable to respond, then it's time to get a big nail, drive it in the wall, and hang the gloves on it. Briscoe ignored McCall's advice. Now believing that he had stayed with McCall for too long, he stated that he felt like a child that was never allowed to say anything for himself. George Benton, one of Briscoe's prior victims, had retired and was now a trainer. Benton had been in and out of hospitals for two years after a bullet struck him in his back and chipped away a part of his spine. Initially, he declined to train Briscoe out of respect for McCall, but after it became apparent that the two were on the outs, Benton agreed. In Benton, Briscoe would have a trainer that didn't lecture him the way McCall did. Instead, he had a peer, someone who talked to him man to man. One of the first changes Benton made was that he had Briscoe stop working with weights in his hands, as it made his arms slower. He also explained Archie Moore's secret to longevity and that the old mongoose only got hit maybe once a year. Once a guy gets to be 30, Benton said, he can't keep trading punches and stay in the business. Benton said that Briscoe reminded him of a fine old automobile. Find an old car that has been taken care of over the years, Benton said. Tune it up. Don't push it beyond what it was meant to do and you'll find you have something that runs better than most of the new models. Under Benton's tutelage, Briscoe would get a second wind. Me and George, Briscoe said, we're like butter. We melt and run together.
After the win over Sammy Barr, Briscoe would meet Valdez again for his third try at the title. He thought he won, but the judges ruled otherwise. I guess it just wasn't meant to be, Briscoe said. My mama always told me, you have to have faith in the Lord. When he's ready for you to have something, you'll have it. My time hasn't come yet, but I believe it will. Briscoe would take a year off. He would pay off his mother's house in Augusta, Georgia, before stepping back into the ring against future champion Vito Antuofermo. The fight would alternate between Briscoe showing flashes of his former self and then showing his age. After the loss, he would travel to Kansas City to take on the local favorite Tony Chiaverini, and this time he had enough left in the tank to score the upset. But in August of 1978, Briscoe would be brought in against the now most feared man in the division, Marvin Hagler. Benton didn't like the match, but the money was too much to refuse. The bout would exceed the proceeds of the heart fights, attracting the largest spectrum crowd for a non-title fight. Now years past his prime, Briscoe never had a chance to win. But Boston Globe writer Lee Montville couldn't help but be impressed with his determination. Briscoe was a pest of a fighter, Montville wrote, a pumpkin-faced man looking like some third encounter creature, coming ahead, coming ahead, never stopping, always coming ahead. Benton's strategy was simple. I knew the other guy was going to fight like he did, moving and firing as he went, Benton said. If he stands there with a guy like Benny, he gets KO'd. If Benny stays outside, he gets KO'd. So I told him to stay inside, figuring that with the kind of pressure Benny can put on, Hagler would have to stop and fight. Well, Benny followed the plan to perfection, did every damn thing I asked him to do, but the other guy is young, strong, and awfully good. Briscoe's hopes of getting another title shot went from a dimming hope to now delusion. Manager Arnold Weiss, who ignored previous suggestions to sit down Briscoe years earlier, now had to make a deeper assessment on whether or not Briscoe should retire. But Briscoe himself had no intention of quitting the sport insisting that he had a few years left. After a decision win over Teddy Mann, Briscoe seemed to have lost more than a step in losses against Clement Shinsha and Richie Bennett. George Benson then joined the chorus in advising Briscoe to quit, but Briscoe remained adamant about continuing his career. Benton didn't talk up for me when they tried to retire me, Briscoe said, but I can understand what he was doing. He was trying to protect himself. He didn't give a bleep about me. He trains with all the fighters in Philadelphia, and they said, Georgie, I think Briscoe should retire. And he said, yeah, all I did for him, and he shoved me down the bleeping drain. Briscoe fought on, now losing to fighters that wouldn't have lasted five rounds with him in its prime. Promoter Russell Peltz wrote a letter to the Athletic Commission to get them to permanently suspend Briscoe's license to box. Peltz had Briscoe's best interest at heart, but Briscoe took umbrage, claiming that Peltz was trying to blackball him. He wrote a letter to New York State and told him I was punchy, Briscoe complained. By 1980, manager Arnold Weiss was receiving offers of over $30,000 from fighters like Thomas Hearns and Curtis Parker. Weiss refused the offers, not wanting Briscoe to get hurt and wanting him to hang the gloves up. I'll quit, Briscoe said, when the good man upstairs puts his hands on me and says, Benny Briscoe, it's time to quit. Sports writers began comparing Briscoe to Willie Mays, stumbling around in center field with the New York Mets, fighting fly balls, overstaying his welcome. After two consecutive losses in 1982, Briscoe finally hung up the gloves. He would have a retirement party with over 400 people in attendance. Marvin Hagler, Emil Griffith, Eddie Mustafa Muhammad, and Russell Peltz were among the attendees to pay respect to Briscoe. Briscoe would become more reclusive as the years went on, and his health declined. He would die in hospice care at the age of 67. To paraphrase Philadelphia sports writer Ray Didinger, Benny Briscoe never wanted sympathy. He didn't want do-gooders tugging on his robe, begging him not to climb back into the ring. He didn't want lectures about what might happen if he caught one punch too many. And he grew tired of people harping on his age instead of his accomplishments. Benny Briscoe is a legend. And legends, he said are not to be pitied.